Shalom. The year is 1948. Creation is about to take a sharp, decisive turn. It seems that God's promises come true after all. The nation of Israel is established. Except, I'm talking pre here. I'm talking about pre-modern Israel's birth, very pre. I'm not talking about 1948 of the Common Era. I'm talking about 1948 BCE, before the Common Era. What a coincidence. That's the year that our father, Avraham, was born, 1948. And we meet him face to face in this week's Torah portion of Lech Lecha. This week's Torah portion, and in the next two Torah portions, we get acquainted a little bit with this person, Avraham, or now as he's first called, Avram. He gets the call to come down to the land. This week's Torah portion he goes down to Egypt afterwards in a time of famine. He returns, he parts ways with Lot, he fights with kings, he risks it all to save his nephew. He receives a covenant with God at the covenant between the portions that will affect his descendants until the end of time. He gets word of the eventual Egyptian exile and redemption. He deals with Hagar and Ishmael. He receives the covenant of circumcision and a new name and a new destiny. And all that is just in this week's Torah portion. Next week, we meet Avraham the hospitable, Avraham the prophet, and Avraham who is tested with his tenth and final test. Avraham, who intercedes on behalf of the city of Sodom, and Avraham, who finally has that tenth test, he has his precious son, only to have to bind him, nearly burn him as an offering. He is Avraham, who is called the righteous, he's called the friend of God, he's called the beloved of God. He is the author of a mystical work called the Book of Formation. He knew how to utilize the forces that created heaven and earth. Avraham, who learned according to our sages, the entire Torah before it was even given, who kept, indeed, the whole Torah, who was the first of all believers. But who was he? Who was Avraham? Ezekiel, chapter 33, verse 24, says, Avraham was one. And the famous Psalm 89 calls Avraham Eitan HaEzrachi, the citizen. He was a citizen of the world because he took responsibility for the whole world. He comes in, in this week's Torah portion, just blazing. But where did he come from? And from whence did he des derive his strength and who taught him? Not his father. Isaiah rhetorically asks the same thing. He says, who inspired the one from the east, at whose every footstep righteousness attended? Who delivered nations to him and subdued kings before him? Who made his enemies like dust before his sword, like straw blown about before his bow? He pursued them and emerged unhurt on a path where his feet had never gone. Who brought about and accomplished this? I want to read this whole thing to you from Isaiah chapter 41. The verses continue and say, Who proclaimed, and the answer, the answer of who did all this? He who proclaimed the generations from the beginning. I, Hashem, am the first, and I am he who will be with the last generations. The islands saw and feared. The ends of the earth shuddered. They approached and came. Each man would help his fellow worship idols. And to his brother he would say, be strong. The woodworker would encourage the goldsmith. The finishing hammer would encourage the one who pounds from the start. He would say of the glue, this is good. And he would strengthen it with nails so that it should not loosen. This is exactly the world that our forefather Avraham confronted, the world of idolatry. But you, O Israel, my servant Jacob, you whom I have chosen, offspring of Avraham who loved me, you whom I shall grasp from the ends of the earth and shall summon from among all its noblemen, and to whom I shall say, you are my servants. I have chosen you and not rejected you. This is the legacy of our forefather, Avraham. And there are questions that I would like to explore. There's so much about our forefather Avraham that we don't understand. There are questions of Avraham's faith, of that Torah that he kept, his coming to the land. These questions are ancient of days and they're pre-everything. 
And the Zohar reminds us that Avraham did not enter into a covenant with God until he entered into the land. As we mentioned, there is an idea, there is a teaching that even before the Torah was given at Mount Sinai, even before indeed the nation of Israel was established, Avraham kept the whole Torah before it was given. And he was the first of all believers. But what do we mean by that exactly? There were ten generations from Adam, from Adam, the first man, until Noah. And then another ten generations from Noah until Avraham. And all this time, it just wasn't taking. It just wasn't working. There just wasn't anybody about whom, as Isaiah said regarding Avraham, that Hashem had said, the one who loved me. And here's what the sages of the Midrash say and how they describe it. They say, it's like, until our father Avraham, so Hashem was king over the heavens only. But in Avraham's time, he became king over the heavens and the earth. As it states in the Torah, Hashem founded the earth with wisdom. He established the heavens with understanding. And the Midrash says, listen, there are special people, high people, people of heaven, that are able to perceive the Creator by themselves with no teacher or instruction. This is a person of some level of understanding who understands everything just, from him, just by himself. Not like earthy people, say the Midrash, who could only comprehend God if they have a teacher and some sort of instruction. But as Ezekiel said, one was Avraham. He understood everything. He had nobody to turn to. He understood everything on his own. And the Midrash continues, and our sages say in a very cryptic, in a very esoteric sounding, and a very enigmatic statement, they say that Avraham's two kidneys became like two fountains of wisdom. And on his own, he comprehended that the world has a master. And this Avraham was a person, a true person, of higher understanding, and he brought the knowledge and the comprehension of the Creator into this world. But how did he come to this? And what was this Torah that he kept before it was given? The Torah, the level of knowledge of God that Avraham was able to intuit on the kidney level. This is a great mystery. How did Avraham observe the commandments before there was in Israel, before the commandments were commended to Israel? This kidney level, this idea of something that is just generated from within. It's just a natural truth. So there's a famous Midrashic account about the start of Avraham's career, how he confronted his idolatrous father, Terach. And many people are somewhat familiar with this story. It's quite famous, but it's not a story. It's not a tale or an anecdote. It contains and communicates vast truths. So I think this would help us to understand and answer our questions a little bit about Avraham, about his faith, about his level of Torah, everything, again, pre. So I'd like to present the original version of this Midrashic account translation, courtesy of yours truly. Let's examine the text of this account, and it goes like this. And I quote, statement of our sages, ancient teaching. Terach, Avraham's father, was an idol salesman. One time, he had to leave the store, and he left Avraham to do the selling in his absence. People came in to buy, and Avraham would say to them, for example, how old are you? And the man would say, I'm 50 years old, I'm 60 years old. And Avraham would say, what? A 50 or 60 year old man? Avraham would say, whoa, to this man, what a, what a pathetic man, 60 year old man bowing down before an idol that was made today. And the customer would be embarrassed and would depart without making a purchase. Once, continues the Midrash, a woman came in with a plate of flour and she said to Avraham, please take this and offered in front of them, in front of these gods. Avraham got up. Here's the famous part that you might have heard. Took a stick, smashed all the idols on the showroom floor except for the largest one, and then he took the stick and left it in the hands of the biggest idol, which he didn't destroy. And as, when his father returned, he asked him, who did this? And Avraham said, how could I hide the truth from you? A woman came in with a plate of flour and said, please offer it to them. I offered it to them, but one said, I'm eating this first, and the other one said, I'm eating it first. And the big one there stood up and said, I got news for all of you, I'm eating this. And he destroyed all the others. And Avraham's father said to him, 
It's a very ancient text that I'm sharing with you now. Avraham's father said to him, what are you trying to give me here? They have no intelligence. And Avraham said to his father, if only your ears would hear what your mouth is saying. At that, Terach, the unnatural father, took Avraham to the authorities. The authorities meaning Nimrod. Nimrod was a very, very bad man. And Nimrod said, this has got to stop. This is your last chance. Let's see how sick you are with this business. Nimrod says, here's your chance. Bow down before the fire. That's my God. Bow down before the fire. But Avram said, but maybe we should bow down before water because water extinguishes fire. So Nimrod said, fine, fine. You're right. Bow down to the water. And I'll let you go. Avram said, the truth is, maybe we should bow down to the clouds because clouds carry the water. And uh, to which Nimrod said, okay, bow down to the clouds. That's fine. And Avram said, but the wind disperses the clouds. We should bow down to the wind. So Nimrod said, that's true also, bow down to the wind. And Avram said, maybe we should bow down to a man, because a man is able to withstand and hold the wind. At this point, Nimrod said, quote, you talk too much. I personally only bow down to the fire. I'm throwing you in. Let the God that you bow down to come and save you. And that's what he did. And this is a very famous principle in our tradition that Avraham was thrown into the fiery furnace of Nimrod. But he strolled, that's the language of our sages, he strolled in that fiery furnace, cool as a cucumber. Doesn't say that, that's my own metaphor. And he exited unscathed. Look at the language of this Midrash and what it reveals. Nimrod, who represented institutionalized, organized religion, that is to say the politically correct version of what people should be thinking, society, he would have been satisfied if Avraham bowed to any of those things. Just grab something, man. Choose something and bow down as long as you say it's God. It could be fire, water, clouds, it doesn't matter, but you talk too much. We don't want to hear this idea of one creator, one God, of, an, of one principle, concept <clears throat> of right and wrong and acknowledging the truth of the creator of the universe. We don't want to hear this. And his own father felt he was too dangerous and delivered him into Nimrod's hands because this is dangerous, because this is dangerous for our thing for our way of life, this kind of talk of one God. And this is what Avraham confronted his entire life, as we read in chapter 41 of the book of Isaiah, all the world united between the hammersmith and, and, the, and, and the glue, and everybody making the idols together, encouraging each other. This is what uh, the world that Avraham confronted. And how did Avraham, in this context, coming from this background, how did he reach his conclusions? and merit to be called one. The sages liken this to a man who sees the most beautiful building, castle, structure, so exquisitely designed, and says, with all sincerity, stands outside and says, who is the master of the, of the, of the house? Is the master of the house in? And suddenly God appeared for him and said, I am the master of the house. He made his appearance. Why? Why did he make this appearance for Avraham after 20 generations? Because Avraham asked. And that asking was on a whole nother level. It was on that kidney level of what must be true, what I know, what I can't hide from, what I know I can believe, what I will not deny. It's inside of me. It takes a big man, a man of heaven, a man unafraid of the fire, an Avraham. That's the level of the true Torah, which actually is inside every one of us, the Torah, the pre-Torah, waiting to be activated. He knew because he wanted to know, and he found the truth because he was consumed with knowing the truth, and he observed the whole Torah. Before it was given on the same gut level, before it was given on the level of its very roots, of what it means, of what it represents, of what it does for the individual and the world, of what it means to keep God's commandment, His ethic, His code, His promise, 
what that does for the individual and the world. So that was his level, and the level upon which our forefather Avraham related, and therefore the level upon which he kept these commandments, their root level, their preform, in the land of Israel. As we mentioned, he only entered into God's covenant when he entered into the land of Israel. And the first recorded statement that God makes to Avraham after this revelation that's between the lines where he revealed himself to Avraham, go from everything you know, from your family, from the place of your birth, from all that idolatry, and go to the land that I will show you. He doesn't even name it yet because it's all pre. This program today is about pre. Go to that land of Israel, go to that land, and there Avraham sanctified it for future generations on the level of roots. He confronted all the forces that he found there as we read in chapter 12 and verse 6. Uh, a couple of words that might seem insignificant. It says, and the Canaanites were in the land then. This is representative of all the negativity that was in that land that he was able to remove. He rectified these forces. And here is a profound secret and another bridge between Parshat Lech Lecha and last week's Torah portion of Noah. It's actually a second bridge because the first bridge is simply the fact that in the end of Parshat Noah, chapter 11 and verse 26, we are introduced to Avraham with the news of his birth. And that is such a profound idea of why suddenly Avraham comes into the world at the conclusion of Parshat Noah. And the truth of it is so simple and yet so profound that, again, God's disappointment, as it were, as he himself states after the conclusion of, at the conclusion of the Parsha of Breshit, the first Torah portion coming into the necessity for the retribution of the flood, and then after the flood also things were not so simple. We still had other, other uh, aspects of rebellion. Avraham, again, was that person that was putting it all together, that wanted to bring God into the world, that wanted to be a reflection of that oneness, that wanted, that was willing, because he could not deny the truth and because he wanted the truth, he was willing to guarantee to God for the future of humanity that this knowledge will be given over, that the world will learn that there is only one God. And that's why Abraham appears to us after the flood, because God must have been quite, as it were, upset and really wanting to know that I'm not going to have to go through this again. Who is going to get up here and say, you know what, <clears throat> I will see to it that man knows who you are. That was Avraham. There's another amazing bridge between some of the concepts of the Parsha that preceded Lech Lecha Noach, the concept of the flood, and our Parsha of Lech Lecha. And that is an amazing teaching that we need to understand in order to understand God's calling of Avraham at the start, the outset, Parshat Lech Lecha, his calling of Avraham into the land that I will show you to begin his career. And of course, the land of Israel is the center of creation. It's the place of the Garden of Eden. It's the place of the Holy Temple. It's the place that Hashem chose. It's the foundation of the world. And especially when we take that into consideration, especially in that light, we have a major question about one of the most fascinating teachings of our sages relating to the flood, and that is that when the great flood came upon the earth in the time of Noah, the floodwaters did not enter into the land of Israel. <coughs> and this is an amazing idea. However, we could picture that in our mind that somehow there was some sort of um, some sort of boundary, and the floodwaters did not enter into the land of Israel. Well, what does that mean exactly? Is it because the land of Israel is higher, uh, holier? Is it because it didn't need the waters of the flood? So first, we need to understand on a deep level what was the flood really all about. For example, the waters of the flood they permeated a certain, a certain level of the earth itself. The earth itself was punished 
Why? Why was that necessary? If all of life had gone, had gone bad, had become um, negative, why was the earth itself punished? And our sages teach this great secret about the flood that its purpose was to restore balance. You see, because the physicality of the world itself was that that caused man to sin. It was very um, uh, physical. It was very um, lusty. It was, it was uh, permeated with, a, with this aspect of, um, um, of denseness. And in order for the balance to be restored, cleansed, God dulled and softened the power and the intensity of the physical pull of the earth itself that was leading man astray. But in Israel, in the land of Israel, this didn't happen. Now this is an amazing teaching for us to understand. The power and the draw and the pull, the earthiness of the land remains the same according to this mystical teaching, remains the same in Israel as it was before the flood. Here, if you'll pardon it, the expression, nothing is watered down. It's the original formula. It's the real thing. God wanted this to be so because the backdrop for life in the land of Israel, which of course, what is life all about for man? It is the choice to be made constantly between good and evil, God wanted this challenge to be completely real. And this by way of explanation, actually for everything that constantly goes on in this land, the intensity, the dichotomy, this is the land into which Abraham entered at this pre-stage, the land that was promised for his descendants forever, a land in which the stage is set for the ultimate rectification of, of human personality and for man's choice between good and evil to allow him to shine, to make that choice, to choose life. Because everything in the land of Israel is a dimension of a direct relationship with God that is constantly unfolding. The test is so real. Life is so real. There's nothing here that's watered down. And so into this land, God brought Avraham in this week's Torah portion, promised this land to his descendants forever, as we will read in next week's Torah portion, through Isaac shall your seed be called, and indeed, as Ezekiel stated, Avraham was one. Avraham was one. His God is one. His children are one. And David, sweet psalmist of Israel, sums up Avraham's entire legacy. We find the verse in 2 Samuel. Because you are great, Hashem, God, for there is none like you, and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people, like Israel, one nation on earth, whom God went forth to redeem unto himself as a people?